This is our God. We trusted in him. He saved us. This is the Lord in whom we trusted. Let us rejoice in the salvation he brings. Who can rejoice here tonight? A few people? Verse 6, you know, it says here, all the people of the world. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus died for the sins of every single person on this planet. There's not one person that is exempt from that. Matthew 8, 11 tells us, and I tell you this, that many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from the east and to the west, to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the feast of the kingdom of heaven. When we reach heaven, there is going to be a big party. You know, it talks about this great feast where we're going to enjoy the best food we've ever had. It talks about the best wine. You know, we know that Jesus is the ultimate winemaker. When he was at that wedding and he turned water into wine, you know, the, the, the guys that were there said, hey, this is the best wine we've ever heard, we've ever had. You know, you save the best for the last. Why is that? You know, usually they would save the weaker stuff for last when people are already drunk. Give them the weak stuff, they won't know the difference. But when Jesus turned water into wine, he gave them the best. And, you know, that's what he wants for our lives is the best of the best. You know, when we read about heaven, we see that we're given mansions in heaven. No one's having little shacks. No one's living in tents. We all have mansions. The streets are paved out of gold. No more hot black asphalt when it's 150 degrees and you can't even walk on it. But it's perfect. You know, we're going to talk more about heaven in a minute. But this is a place that God has designed for us. And, you know, he wants us to be in eternity with him there forever. Amen? Amen. Verses 7 to 8. You know, let's reference 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 54. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. You know, that is the promise of heaven, is there is no more death. It's gone. You know, this, this world, we, we are surrounded by death. And death is a result of sin. It goes back to the time of Adam and Eve. You know, that, that story you might have heard as a kid, you know, many people think it's a fable, but it is our, it's our uh, history. It's how we began. You know, God created these two perfect beings and says, here, I've given you the earth. It is yours. Go fill it, multiply, do good things. Just stay away from this tree. And then what happened? Eve was tempted. She saw that tree. She was told by the serpent, that tree, it's good for the eyes. It tastes good. It'll give you life. It'll, it will give you everything you want, right? And she listened to the lie. She chased after the lie. Here she had the true and living God who gave her the perfect world, and she chased after the lie. And then her husband followed and chased after it as well. Suddenly their eyes were open. They now knew good and evil. They now had a choice in the matter. It was no longer, I can live this perfect life. Now I have the opportunity to sin. My eyes have been opened to those things. And since that time, we are fallen men and women. We now are slaves to sin, Romans tells us, 6 tells us. Slaves to sin, think about that. You have no choice but to sin. But when Jesus died, he came to give us eternal life. He, kept, he came to set us free from those sin. We are no longer bondage to sin. We're now slaves to righteousness, the Bible tells us. We have a choice in the matter. We can choose to do good things. You know, it's funny, when you, when you meet people that, are, that have, are outside the kingdom of heaven, they've never experienced Jesus in any way, they don't recognize the sin that's in their life, the bondage that they're under, because they've never known anything else. You know, again, we were born under Adam and Eve with that sin. But once we experience the goodness of God, our lives change. You know, uh, I look back at the, 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 the path that I was on in my own mind. You know, I was a young kid. I was 13 when I chose to follow the Lord. You know, someone came and showed me the gospel, and I said, that's what I need, because I knew where I was headed. I knew what my mind was capable of, and God intervened in my life and says, no, I have a purpose and a plan for your life, and I want to separate you from the rest. And it was kind of interesting growing up because a lot of my friends, I would see them fall victim into all kinds of problems in their life, all kinds of sin. And for me, it was easy to just say, no, I have no interest in that. And people around me would say, well, why not? I don't know. I just don't desire those things. I don't feel the peer pressure to be involved in those things like everybody else is because I just don't see the need in it because the Holy Spirit changed my life. He showed me that you have a, a, I have a new plan for you. I have eternity in mind. And 
you know, there's a phrase I learned in, in youth group. It was, keep your eyes on the prize. You know, salvation being the prize. Heaven being the prize. Jesus being the prize. If I keep my eyes on the prize, I don't have to worry about the problems of this life. And I'll tell you, every time I face challenges in my life, it's when I've taken my eyes off of Jesus. It's when I've put them back on my problems and my situations, and now I'm trying to do it my way under my power. And I fail every time. But when I put my eyes back on Jesus, the problems in my life, he offers answers. He can fix any challenge in your life. And he says, just submit to me. Lay those problems before me, and I will handle them. Let's read verses 7 and 8 again here. He will remove from the cloud of gloom the shadow of death that hangs over the earth. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away tears. He will remove forever all insults and mockery against the land and people. The Lord has spoken. Revelation 21.4 tells us also that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. This is speaking of our time in heaven. You know, we have a lot of reasons on this earth to shed tears. A lot of reasons. And, and everyone's life here is different. The problems you face are not the same problems that I face, right? But we've all had those, those situations we've been in, and all we can do is cry because we don't have an answer for it. And he tells us that I'm going to wipe away every single tear in your life. They're gone. You'll never have to be in sorrow again. In heaven, there will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more death. I mean, that is a glorious thing. You know, that is the promise of eternity that God has for you here today. My papers are stuck together. Verse 9. In that day, the people will proclaim, this is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord in whom we trusted. Let us rejoice in the salvation he brings. 1 John 1, 9. But if we confess with our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness or all unrighteousness. All sin in our life, he is capable of cleansing. You know, for those that don't know, I, I spent several years living in Africa, and uh, one of the times when I was visiting there, we got to go out and... Uh, to share the gospel with some people. And uh, I've never been uh, a person that likes to go out and talk to strangers. It's just, it's never been in my nature. So when we were in these groups, I said, that's great. I'll just be there and I'll support them. I'll pray for whoever. And uh, the, the leader of our group was a man named Richard. He was a local, he spoke the local language. And so I, I go out with him. There's probably six or seven of us. And we get to this house and he starts talking and he's talking in a local language. So I'm praying for him. And then after about five minutes, he turns to me and says, okay, Rob, I've introduced you. Now it's your turn to share. And it kind of freaked me out because I wasn't ready for that. And, you know, so I asked the Lord for wisdom. And so I began to share every house we went to. I would just tell them the simple news that Jesus loved them, that Jesus had a plan for their lives. And one of the houses we went to, uh, there were several women. They were all kind of there washing clothes and working together. And one of them was, she was really old. She had to be close to 90 years old. I mean, you could see it in her face. She, she had lived a life. And uh, she, she raised her hand and she says, I have done some of the most despicable and wicked things on this earth. She says, can Jesus even cleanse me? I said, absolutely. He can cleanse the sin of the most wicked of the earth. And, you know, for some people, that's a challenge to say, how can God forgive these very, very wicked people who have done, you know, and they give all these different sins, you know, child molesters and, and mass rapists and, and mass murders. How can God forgive them? Because he loves each of us equally. And the, the atonement that he provided on the cross, it covers all sin. You know, there is no person who can out sin the Lord because he's, he has forgiven all things. And in our human minds, you know, that's a challenging thing because I say, gosh, that person doesn't deserve salvation. But why do I deserve it? I mean, I have to compare myself and say, why do I deserve, but they don't? You know, that's according to my standard. But where, what is my standard? My standard is unequal. You know, when I compare myself to other people, I'll always come out on top, right? I mean, do we give ourselves an honest judgment when we compare our lives to each other? No, we, ju we just don't. We're selfish. 
I'm number one. That's all it comes down to. But when we look at God's law, he gave us 10 simple commandments. And when we start looking at these commandments, we realize that we fail. You know, one of the first ones that when we're young is honor your parents. Well, I can guarantee every person in here has failed that one. If you've ever received any kind of discipline from your parent, you, you did not honor them. You did not listen to what they say. And anyone that's had kids, you know that. You know, I've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old. There's not a day that goes by that someone's not in trouble. You know, we just naturally are born sinners. You know, he, he tells us, do not steal. I start looking back at my life, and I say, gosh, well, I've never stolen anything major. I've never stolen anyone's car. I've never, you know, held anyone up at gunpoint. But I, I've stolen all kinds of little things for the years. Something I'm like, hey, I like that. They don't need that. I need it. Let me take it. And it could be something small. But most of us in here have stolen something at some point in our lives. You know, we say, well, gosh, I know that it says do not murder. I've never murdered anyone, so I know I'm good. But then Jesus said this. He said, if you've ever had anger in your heart, the anger, that, you know, it, it's the same as murder. If you've ever hated someone in your heart, it's just as bad as murdering them. You know, just because you haven't committed the actual act, you know, the Bible tells us that God judges the heart. He, he doesn't look at our actions near as much as he looks at our hearts because the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. The Bible says, who can know the heart? You know, is there anyone here that says, I would like my mind to be opened up where anyone could hear my thoughts? I mean, would anyone say, yes, I'm okay with that? None of us. Because we recognize, man, what's going on in here does not need to be shared with anybody else. You know, that kind of shows us how wicked we truly are, how deceitful we are. You know, the Bible also says, do not commit adultery. But then, you know, Jesus said, if you've ever looked at a woman and lusted after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. I mean, we can look at all Ten Commandments, and if we truly compare our lives to them, we're going to find out that we break every single one of the commandments. You know, whether I steal a pack of gum or whether I steal a car, I am, I am a thief nonetheless, right? You know, whether I tell a small lie or whether I tell, you know, I'm a big politician and I tell all kinds of lies, I'm still a liar either way. I don't want to get political, but we all know politicians lie. But again, it doesn't matter where we judge ourselves because God is the ultimate judge. He's the one that examines our hearts and he says, you are wicked, I created you sinless, but you've chosen sin. But Jesus says that I came to this earth to die for your sins, to give you eternal life. He did this 2,000 years ago, and the whole purpose was to forgive us our sins. You know, the Jews were God's chosen people, and every year they would have to go to the temple and sacrifice their goats and their sheep and their cows and their birds to pay for their sin to try to be right in the eyes of the Lord. But there's just no way that that's going to be a permanent solution. You know, I, if I start trying to tally up all the sin I've committed in my life, I, don't, I can't buy enough cows. It's impossible. And Jesus says, I'm coming to be that final sacrifice. I will live a sinless life. Jesus never wants to sin. You know, he stood before a trial, and they could not convict him of a single thing. They had scores of people come forward, and every accusation they made against him turned out to be a lie. They had evidence proving that it was a lie. They never convicted him of anything, yet he still died on the cross. And he went willingly. You know, he had the power to come off. They even said, if you're a God, call the angels, bring yourself down. And he said, no, I'm going willingly. The last words that he, that he said on the cross were, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know who they're killing. They just saw him as a man who threatened their way of life. And instead, he had a plan. And after three days of being in the grave, he conquered death. You know, he waited three days to prove that it was true. And there was a lot of uh, speculation that came out and said, well, he wasn't really dead. And, you know, all these different theories. But if you study the Romans, who are the ones who, who executed him, you would know that they are experts on death. They don't mess up. He was truly dead because they did their job. Then they even put guards in front of his tomb because they thought, okay, his disciples are going to try to steal his body and say that, look, he lives. He's no longer in the tomb. So they put 16 guards out there. Now, these guards would have faced a penalty of death if they themselves didn't fulfill their job in guarding this tomb. And after three days, 
An angel rolled that stone away and Jesus walked right out of there. And those guards were paid off to say that the disciples stole the body. But again, according to their own Roman law, they would have been executed for allowing that to happen. Yet they stood there and they, they told the truth. This is what happened. And their, their bosses were like, here, just say, the, the, say that the disciples took his body. You know, but the point is he conquered death. He, he proved he was dead and he set us free so that we no longer are slaves to sin. We no longer have to face that, that separation from God in that, that place we don't like to talk about called hell. That place of, it's called a lake of fire, of everlasting torment. We don't like to talk about it because it's a scary thing. You know, and Jesus had some very difficult words to say about hell. He even said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So not everyone who says, I believe in you, is going to heaven. And that's, that's a scary thought. But he says, only those who do my will, those who choose to follow me. You know, why is that so important? Well, Jesus identified himself as the son of God, okay? So you've only got a couple of ways you can uh, deal with that. You can either believe it for who you, okay, I believe you are the son of God, or you have to say, this guy is a liar. He either is telling the truth or he's lying. Those are the only options. There are no other options. So he proved who he was. You know, he proved through death that he was the son of God because nobody else has ever conquered death. No one. And it will never happen again. So if you reject that idea, well, then you just have to reject Christ completely. But if you, if you say, okay, I believe that you are the son of God, that you did conquer death, but you choose not to follow after him. He says, if you, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. If you love me, you'll do these things. Well, you, you can't just say, I believe and that's it. I'm going to dismiss the rest of my life. I believe it. I, I, I walked down an aisle one day. I, I prayed a prayer one day. I'm good. But Jesus said, there's so much more to that. Choose to follow me. And the reason that he says, follow me, is because I want to work in your life. I want to work in and through you and give you the life you deserve. John 10.10 10 tells us that he came to give us the abundant life. You know, he doesn't want us to continue in our sorrows and our misery and our depression and our anxiety and our loneliness. He says, I have come to give you the better life, the abundant life, if you follow me. He says, I've taken those 10 commandments, those do not, do not, do not, and I've summed them up into two. The first one is love God, and the other one is love people. He says, if you love God and you love people, you have fulfilled the entire law. You're no longer guilty of those other things because you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. So that's what we're presenting here tonight, that Jesus loves you, he has a purpose and a plan for your life, and he doesn't want you to walk the life that you've lived in the past. He wants to give you a new life. Second Corinthians tells us that we are new creations in Christ. We're no longer the same. The old has passed away. The new has come. You know, this new life in Christ, it is the best decision you can ever make. It truly is. If you have not done that, today is the day of salvation, the Bible tells us. You know, there is, tomorrow is promised to no man. And we should know that. We look at people in our lives that we've lost through the years. Many people, very unexpectedly. They were here one day and they're gone the next. Tomorrow is promised to no man. Today is the day of salvation. So today is the day that I challenge you. You know, I'm, I'm going to give you a difficult challenge. If there's anyone here that has not received Christ, I'm going to challenge you to actually get up out of your seats and come forward. You know, that may not be a usual thing, but this is a night of revival. This is what we do. And Jesus even, he says, you know, when he called his disciples, he told them to leave what they were doing and to come and follow him immediately. It was a public thing. He says, come and do that in front. Come and do it in front of your friends. Come and do it in front of your families. Make a stand that you're one of my disciples. You're going to follow me the rest of your life. And those 12 disciples he called, they did exactly that. They were out in a boat fishing and he says, come and follow me. They dropped the nets and they got up and they left. They didn't even put anything away. They didn't go home and tell their family what was going on. They said, okay, I'm going now. And they followed him. You know, that's the commitment he wants for us. He wants us to say, okay, today I choose to follow you. Today I'm choosing to no longer sin. I'm changing my mind of the way it used to be. And I have new life. I'm following you.
So I want to encourage you, if, if this is you, if this, if this has been speaking to you, I want to encourage you to get up out of your seat and come forward even right now. If you've even made a commitment in the past to follow Christ and you don't feel that you're walking in that, come forward and recommit now. If there's any person at all, come forward. If there's more, come forward. Because today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that, that Jesus has called you to be a part of his kingdom because he loves you. Amen. Brandon, you guys want to come forward? If there's anyone else, we want to pray with you. You know, you don't have to fear because every, every other person in this room, we're assuming, is, is a follower of Christ. They've already done the same thing. They've already come forward and said, I want to follow Jesus. I know sometimes getting up in front of people is scary, but don't worry about that. Don't worry about what people are thinking because what they're doing is they're praying for you. They're saying, praise God, we support you and we're praying for you. Can I have our prayer team also come forward? So you four guys, today's a bold statement in your lives. Praise God. Give them a hand. Support them. Jesus said these simple things. He says, follow me, right? Repent of sin, which means change your mind. Stop sinning. Choose to follow me today. So we're just, I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. All you have to do is repeat after me this prayer, and you're already saved. The, the prayer is nothing magical, but it's expressing what's going on in your heart. Amen? Let's pray. Say, dear Jesus, today I want to follow you. I recognize that you have forgiven my sin. As far as the east is from the west, I don't want to live my old life. I want to live my life for you. Send your Holy Spirit. Change me. Grow me into the man you've called me to be. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God.